Hi, my name is Penilla Rodlin. I'm Managing Director of Rodlin Consulting and Europe, Middle East and Africa Representative of Japan Intercultural Consulting. Welcome to Japanese Business Mysteries Explained in 5 Minutes, Part 3, Old Technology. Non-Japanese people who work for Japanese companies are often surprised by how old-fashioned and antiquated the technology being used inside Japanese companies is, both in terms of systems and the actual equipment itself, especially when you consider how Japanese companies have been so innovative in producing mobile phones, Walkmans, etc. in the past, and how much Japanese love new innovative technology themselves. I think there are three root causes to this. One is the history and particularly the way that Japanese language has influenced how technology has developed. Secondly, the tendency in Japan to stick to the process and only improve it incrementally. And thirdly, the high level of risk aversion that you get in Japanese companies. So looking at the first aspect, anyone who's tried to study Japanese language will know that it's an incredibly difficult language to master because you have to have at least 1,800 kanji that you can read and write. These are pictograms or ideographs taken from Chinese. There's a 46 hiragana syllabic alphabet, which is the kind of glue between the kanji to make a sentence. And there is a 46 syllabic character katakana alphabet, which is used for foreign language borrowed words. So when typewriters were first developed in Japan, they couldn't have just one keyboard. There were several keyboards. For a typical sentence, you'd probably have to select three different keyboards. So the typists were highly specialised people who were able to manipulate these big machines. So ordinary documents basically were handwritten. And that's why faxes were particularly popular, because you could handwrite a message to a client and then you could send it to them immediately by fax. Even when computers became more widespread, there was an issue around the fact that kanji and hiragana only really work as double byte characters. So they take double the space on the computer and they take double the space on a piece of paper. Whereas normal Roman alphabet fonts are half width single byte characters. Katakana also you can be done as half width. So this meant that two different operating systems ended up being developed. I remember one of the things that ended up in me feeling despair at, in one Japanese company I worked for was that Lotus Notes was being introduced in order to share knowledge and information around the company worldwide. But it turned out that there was going to be one operating system in English for most of the rest of the world and all the Japanese staff were going to have a separate operating system that didn't speak to the English language operating system that was in Japanese. This is what the Japanese call themselves the Galapagos Syndrome, which is that all sorts of great technology is developed in Japan, but it's very specific to the Japanese language and to the Japanese market. On the right there, you have the Oasis Fujitsu computer, which was great for doing graphics on, but not so good in terms of networking. We had one on our whole team that we had to queue up to use, and we had one networked IBM terminal that you could use to send telexes to the rest of the world. So just like the Galapagos Islands, all sorts of species are developed there that thrive, but immediately die in the world outside. And a lot of processes that Japanese companies like to use are very reliant on this sort of handwritten, hand-stamped, face-to-face way of proceeding with business. So the A3 is a way of doing problem solving and planning. You can see up on the right there, you can make it on a computer, of course, but you're meant to walk it around various stakeholders to get their input. And similarly, the Ringi, which is a way of raising money for projects. Again, some companies have in fact tried to automate this and automate the hanko, the hand stamping of your own personal seal on it. But basically, again, people prefer to walk around and talk to people to get their authority for things. Why? Because again, this risk of aversion, the third element that I talked about, they don't like discontinuous big changes to processes because yes, you know, there is much more likelihood of failure. They also prefer nemawashi, which is a way of going around and meeting people before big decisions are made on a very informal personal level, which of course spreads the risk around the company so that it's a collectively held risk, not a single decision maker. And the third risk aversion that Japanese companies feel about office automation is that if you start allowing people to work from home, take their laptops out the building, you will start allowing people to log into a system from outside the building, that this increases is the security risk, particularly around data leaks of confidential information or customer data. Change does happen in Japan, but usually when there's some big outside pressure and it has to be done collectively. So COVID-19 might be the next big outside pressure for Japan. And there is some evidence that, that companies are starting to think collectively within sectors about the change needed. So in this sort of technology sector, you're hearing people like Hitachi, Panasonic, Sony, NEC, all talking about how people working from home is going to be a permanent change, um, not just a temporary measure. And it's got to be for the good of society as well. So again, COVID-19 might well provide that excuse. 
But the trouble is that Japanese housing is not suited to working from home. It is pretty cramped in most Japanese people's houses. There's no room for a working from home office. So there might have to be some innovative thinking around this one, which is maybe creating small local hubs that people who live in the same area can go to to work without commuting too far. So for more on Japanese business, uh, please take a look at rodinconsulting.com. Our blog and our research and our newsletter are there. There's Japan Intercultural Consulting's training, coaching, team building, post-merger integration and so on. And we have quite a lot of e-learning now on Japan Cultural page on teachable.com.